All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ashish John, the Dean of the School of Public Health at Brown, and thank you all for joining us once again uh, for the Dean's Conversation Series, where we try to bring in uh, people who I think are really the leading thinkers uh, whose work impacts public health. Uh, we kicked this series off a year ago with uh, Dr. Tony Fauci, uh, obviously does not need much introduction. Uh, we've had really a, a terrific string of, of people that I've had a chance to sit down with virtually and talk about science, about public health, about uh, where we are as a country in this pandemic. And today's uh, discussant conversationalist, our speaker is no different. Uh, it's Nubar Afayan, who is uh, uh, a, the founder of Flagship Pioneering, who, um, one of the companies that invested in Moderna, has been a uh, has got a PhD in, in engineering from MIT, but has been both an academic, but really a scientist entrepreneur, uh, really thinking about how innovations in biotechnology uh, and life sciences can improve uh, public health and, and medicine around the world. And so huge privilege today, Nubar, to have you here. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'm going to talk, I, we're gonna, I want to get into talking about mRNA technology and Moderna and how you see both the work in the past and what the success of the current vaccines have been. But I wanna come back to that. As I was reading your life story, I was struck in some ways uh, at the similarity at our life stories. I grew up in India, went first to Canada uh, and then found my way uh, to the United States. And I, I was wondering if you could start a little bit with your background um, of growing up in Lebanon, what really prompted uh, you and your family to leave, and your journey uh, to where you are today, more on a personal level. And then we can get into talking about science and all of that in a second. Uh, well, thanks very much, and, and thanks for having me for this conversation. Um, yeah, indeed, I was born in Lebanon and uh, uh, had, a, had a great upbringing there until Civil War struck, uh, and that was in 1975. And there had been various uh, kind of smaller wars, but not in the actual country of Lebanon in the region was a bit volatile in 67 and 73, there were wars, but, but this was a civil war and that completely arrested our, our lives. You know, we spent time away from school, um, by the way, not unlike the pandemic, and I'll come back to that uh, after a little bit. Um, and, you know, after nine months of that uh, and seeing Bombs go off all day long, including a building very close to where we lived, getting totally destroyed and, and just kind of seeing that life and death kind of juxtaposition. Um, we were fortunate enough to, to be accepted uh, by the country of Canada, essentially as political refugees, left the country and uh, resettled in Montreal. And the adaptation to a completely different life, I hadn't seen snow before, uh, the languages were a bit of a challenge. Um, I'd say at a, at a kind of an early stage, uh, certainly did contribute to feeling kind of displaced with both the negative and positive connotations. Uh, and, and I've since come to realize, although this was in hindsight, that much of the things I've gone on and done have their roots in that experience in the sense that I didn't have the, the comfort of, of taking things for granted or feeling native or feeling kind of established and settled. Um, I've felt like an immigrant the whole time since, and, and that's spurned on some of the out-of-the-box things that, that, that I've gone on and tried to do. So the, I, I've come, uh, Ashish, to view, uh, just to summarize 59 years of life now, innovation basically as just intellectual immigration. And I think it's helped me as an immigrant feel comfortable with immigration and taking that notion all the way to immigrating from an innovation standpoint. I love that. I don't know if I've heard of, um, of that as sort of intellectual immigration. It makes um, a ton of sense. I'm gonna ask you a, a, a quasi personal question because I, I have my own version of this. Um, when did you realize um, that your immigrant experience um, was like that you were ha you had a very specific experience that looked very different uh, from others. And I, and I guess part of what I'm trying to get at is, you know, of course I grew up as an immigrant, uh, 
initially in Canada and the United States. And I remember reading a book when I was 18 in first year in college uh, that was very much about the immigrant experience. And all of a sudden, like this light bulb went off in my head. And I was like, oh my God, I've had the immigrant experience. I never thought about that. I had just sort of been living the life I had been living. And all, and that really changed and kind of catalyzed, I think, for me, a sense uh, that there was something different about being an immigrant. Do you have such a moment or do you feel like that came to you sort of more uh, slowly? How how have you thought of that? Um. Yeah, it's a, it's a great, great question, because I think having thought back about it in the last few years, that I could find hints of it decorating my, my memory, but it never really changed the arc of what I did until very recently. And part of that is because during the past administration, when the, the approach to the notion of immigration changed quite drastically, um, I found myself getting uh, offended uh, and feeling uh, as an outsider having lived here for 35 years and, and an American citizen for the last 15 years. Uh, and so it's only that that kind of caused me to look back and say, okay, but what's this been about? So I'll tell you a couple of just um, uh, memories, if you will. Um, you know, as an immigrant, you know, when you're, when you're in a teenage year, you just kind of, it's an opportunity, it's change and you just adapt. And the good news about adaptation is that it preoccupies you. And, and you don't actually think of it as something happening. You just go along with it. Um, I remember very, very fondly uh, uh, early, early days at MIT when I came to do a PhD here in 1983, walking along uh, the long corridor that kind of is iconic of MIT's main entrance. And they have you know, a long series of walls with, with things that are posted, as you can imagine, in every school. Uh, and, and one of these uh, posters, I, I literally remember like it was today, had a, the, the face of a native Indian chief and it was pointing the finger out and the caption read, who are you calling foreigner pilgrim? And I used to walk by there every day. And back then it didn't mean a lot to me, but I used to notice it. And years later I came back because you know MIT was a place of immigrants for that matter, the United States is. The second thing I remember very well is that when I lived in Canada, it was interesting because the expression melting pot Growing up, I had heard of the U.S. as being a melting pot, and it was kind of an awkward expression. I never really knew exactly what that meant. But when I came here, I realized what that really means, which is that being part of the fabric of being American is not about the distinctions, but about the ability to interconnect despite the differences and create a new reality. And I always thought that was the, the beauty of the, of the United States. And and, and boy, over the years, has that gotten lost somewhat, especially in the last few years. So I decided that I need to speak out about it. And that's when I, a lot of these things became that much more clear. And then the last thing I'll say is that, you know, I'd say for, and by the way, this does not mean that you have to be an immigrant to do these kinds of things. It's just that immigrants bring a different perspective, which can be additive to, 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 this, to the fields that we, we enter, regardless of where it is. And that is this comfort with adversity. You know, I, I've come to view much of innovation, much of progress as a purely Darwinian act. That is variation, selection, and iteration, the most important subtext of which is competition. And, and, and our societies are, are competitive. We compete over ideas. We compete over entrance into Brown. We compete over lots of things. And it turns out competition is somewhat an adversarial act. And, and being displaced from one country to another Boy, does that make you comfortable with adversity, not just uncertainty. And that carries on with the very evolutionary nature of then what awaits us. So I'd say that's another thing is that if you can, if you can take that kind of foreign feeling and use it to propel you, I found that that is a, is a big, big strength that is almost regenerative to the US every generation because it brings that a sentiment and even while a second, third generation immigrant only hears about it from their parents, there's fresh examples of it that keeps that going. That's what I've come to believe. I, yeah, and that rings very, uh, certainly rings very true for me. And I will only add that, it, you know, it's interesting because I think America is the one place where you can feel that sense of immigrant and yet you're still deeply American, right? Like there's... Uh, no one gets to sort of say, no, you're not really American because you weren't born here. Um, we're not a country that has had that or 
had that tradition or we've had facets of that tradition, but I think many of us have rejected it. And I think one of the things in the last five years has been, I personally also for the first time in my adult life have questioned, am I actually American or am I really going to be qualified? You know, just because of the shift in, in the political rhetoric, uh, it's been a very unusual five years and I'm hoping that it is, yeah. uh, it, it shifts back to uh, an America where you don't have to have been born here to be an American through and through. I, I may just add one sentiment to it since it's not something I usually talk about, let alone in these kinds of discussions. So I think it just may be worth for people to consider. Uh, I, I come of an Armenian uh, uh, background and there's an expression we use there, but that more recently I've used in the context of, of American. And that is this notion that immigrants that, 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 that become, get citizenship are Americans by choice. Uh, people who are born here are Americans by birth. Right. And it's very easy when you're American by birth to become American by default. But when you choose to be American, uh, that's a very different act. And one of the things that I idealistically would say is that if every American became American by choice, we would be working for the kind of ideals that, that have existed here. But if, if some folks choose to be it and other folks are it, you could imagine where some of these divides could exist. Yeah. So I, I, that's, that's the thought I love that, that I think is an important Good framework. One. I love that. All right. I want to, I want to talk about how a PhD engineer from MIT um, goes to becoming an entrepreneur and how you thought about entrepreneurship as you started with flagship and you started flagship. And then, um, why don't, why don't we start with that part of the journey? And then where I'm going to go next is what happened after the founding of Flagship and how did you, and, and the history and then the kind of the journey to Moderna. Um, so maybe we can take that in two parts. Let's start with, okay, you get your PhD in engineering. Um, talk about how that eventually becomes a part of uh, why you go, went into becoming an entrepreneur and how the PhD and your, your scientific training helped shape your thinking as an entrepreneur. I'm happy to do it, and I'll do it in a, in a very brief way, although if folks are interested, just so happens that a couple of days ago, a podcast uh, that I had uh, recorded with Guy Raz a few months ago appeared, and there's a lot more detail hmm. on that for those who follow his podcast, because we went through quite a bit more detail. And the part that I'll extract from that discussion is actually a fairly defining uh, moment that, 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 that happened when I was a graduate student. Uh, this is now back in 1985. I ended up going to Washington, D.C. for a conference, NSF conference on competitiveness, national competitiveness. Don't ask me why. They had MIT selected a few people to send. And because I was one of a few people doing biotechnology back then, uh, I ended up going. And at this conference at lunch, I ended up sitting next to an older gentleman by my dad's age. And I carried up enough, uh, enough uh, uh, courage to ask him what he did. And he proceeded to tell me that he and another friend of his 30 years earlier had started a company and they were a new breed of engineer, electronic engineers, came out of the power engineering field before that. And they had graduated not knowing what such people would do. And they decided to make instruments that their friends and colleagues in the industry could use to test and design analog circuits. And I listened to this and in my mind, I was kind of creating the parallel between a new breed of engineer, which is what I was, a biological engineer, and the potential use of instruments for the next wave of what people would do. And I, I'd never thought of any of that before. And I was listening to them attentively and, and I kind of I had not heard of what a startup kind of, that was not in my lexicon before that. And I asked him who it was and it was David Packard from Hewlett Packard. And I spent another hour talking to him about how he did that and what he did. And, and he strongly encouraged me, not knowing me to kind of go think about uh, you know, whether such an opportunity existed. And I did. I came back to MIT, tried to figure out how I could take courses. There weren't courses in startups back then in entrepreneurship, but they were on management of innovation and, and, and other technology management uh, uh, things. So finally, I decided that I would try to start a company that would make tools for the biotech industry, which is what I ended up doing in 87. Um, it was a crazy notion back then, but you know, back then, of course, the only people starting companies were middle-aged white men that talk about, you know, diversity. Back then, there were no immigrants, there were no youth. It just was a very, very small set of uh, activities. 
And, and that's how I got my start. So I started a company, became known as Perceptive Biosystems, grew it, ran it for 10 years. We developed the very first mass spectrometers in this industry for proteins and measuring aspects of very precise aspects of, of molecular weight. We developed the very rapid separation technology in proteins. So I grew up basically enabling the biotech industry. And, and along the way, in, the, in so now we're in the mid 90s, that first company went public. I started getting interested in the very active innovation entrepreneurship, but, but for whatever reason, I got interested in the notion of parallel entrepreneurship. Uh, hard for me to figure out why maybe I have attention deficit, but I kind of thought, well, why can't people do multiple of these things at once? And, and I started experimenting. So while even I was running the first company, I helped others start a handful of other companies. One was a drug discovery company, one was a diagnostics company, one was a vaccine company, and started realizing that there's a lot in common across these companies, even though each one of them feels like they're the one and only change the world kind of idea. And that's what led to the formation of Flagship in 1999, 2000, which was an attempt to create an institutional platform to make innovations and to start companies. Amazing. And I love the fact that you sat next to uh, David Packard and uh, he talked to you about, um, about doing this. I mean, you know, these are both incredibly fortuitous and life-changing conversations, right? Um, so let's move now from flagship pioneering to Moderna. And I'm particularly interested in mRNA technology uh, platform for cancer, therapeutics, or vaccines, obviously vaccines against viruses. Um, you know, for a long time, it's been, there's a lot of skepticism that this could ever really work. Um, how did, where, where did your kind of interest, belief, hope, faith, scientific kind of in, in this technology arise? How did that lead to Moderna and uh, just talk a little bit about that process, because I have been, you know, obviously in the last year learning a lot about the kind of history behind uh, the technology that is changing the world. And, and it's not one where everyone immediately saw it coming and everybody thought immediately that this was going to be the thing that was going to revolutionize uh, vaccines, for instance. Uh, but some people clearly did. So I, I'm really curious about that journey, the intellectual journey there, really. So maybe I, sh I just need to spend a couple of minutes telling you what, what flagship pioneering does so you could understand what, yeah. what, this, what the roots of this are. So I mentioned that flagship was set up as an institutional platform to make innovations and create companies. Well, that's what we ended up doing for the 10 years intervening from 2000, 2010 until Moderna was formed. In that we had been experimenting, not with investing because investing is not at all what, we, what we've done, but actually how to make internally breakthrough innovations uh, and, and not breakthrough innovations that are like the most logical next thing to do, because those would not seem like breakthroughs in the first instance, but actually to come up with a way to leap beyond adjacencies. So one thing important, I think, for the audience to understand that most all innovation follows the arrow of advancement in science or technology, where one thing leads to another leads to another, and there's a connectedness between them that ultimately is governed by reasoning. In other words, what is next logical thing to do is determined by the experts of the day. And then people go, well, should I try this? And they go, no, no, that's too big a jump. You should be a little close. So I, I've, I've always thought of this notion of an adjacency around what already exists as the space where progress is made. Hmm. But over time, I realized that that adjacency zone around what already exists and what is known is a very crowded and I'll call it commodity space, because everybody is talking to the same experts who tell you what's logically next. And so everybody works on the same things. So when we started a, a, a flagship, year, a few years into it, we started wondering, could we leap out of the zone of adjacency? How could we leap out of the zone of adjacency? And for people who may be interested in this, there's also a recent article that appeared in Harvard Business Review that lays out our innovation methodology. It's called Emergent Discovery in, in quite a bit of detail. And so we came up with at least a, a, a framework to think about how do you leap outside of where people consider a reasonable next step and how do you persist there? So we, 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 we can tell you a lot about that, I won't do it today. Moderna was the beneficiary of that methodology because Moderna ultimately did not start with an invention 
and then a license and then starting a company. Actually, it was an exploration. And it was an exploration that, yes, was spurred by, and I'll describe it, a, another chance encounter that, that even made me uh, uh, aware of what had been done with mRNA in the past. But, but rather, it was a starting point for a journey. And I'll describe how it happened. So we have a team of people who typically run half a dozen or so of these explorations a year. And they all start with the question, what if? And so it usually ends up being, what if you could do this? What if? Not, I think I can do this, because then it's too late already. Everybody can do this. And, and so I had, a, I had an encounter once <clears throat> brokered by Professor Bob Langer at MIT with, at the time, a junior faculty member at Harvard Medical School Complex at Children's. And he had been using mRNA modified through a technique that was developed at UPenn in order to make Yamanaka factors to transform fibroblasts, human fibroblasts into iPSC cells, something that back in the 2000s was a breakthrough new approach. Uh, you could make uh, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. And then from there, the thought was you could cure diseases or have disease models in the lab. And, and, I, and I saw some of the work they'd done. And what was curious was that whereas unmodified messenger RNA would cause a very strong innate immune response, this at least reduced that a bit, several tens of percents compared to 100% abrogation. And, and, and I listened to this and the idea was, could we do this? Could we use this to make iPSCs? And for various reasons, having explored that space before, we were not interested in that. But, but then, then that raised the question in my mind, which I went back to our team and started working on, which is what if that same notion could be used to cause a, a human to make any protein we wanted in their body as a drug. And, and if you could do that, first, how would you do that? We didn't know. But second, to what end? And what would you expect? And I can tell you, at least now that people are going back and reconstructing what was known and what was not known, that in 2010, this was a complete desert. I mean, there was no ongoing effort as it relates to a therapeutic, let alone vaccine effort, uh, most people had written it off, as has been described before. The work from UPenn had been largely uh, ignored or not really being pursued. And, and that was fine, but, but also that work did not suggest that this was imminently doable. The work suggested that chemistry could ameliorate the innate immune kind of uh, evasion uh, uh, that you would like to have. But beyond that, we didn't know if you could do this in animals. We didn't know if you could make the correct protein, fold correctly, express, secrete correctly at physiological levels, get to the right cells in the body. I mean, none of this was known. And that's what I mean by leap. Because at the time, if you went and asked experts, should I work on mRNA as a therapeutic or vaccine? They'd say there's nothing reasonable about that. There's a lot more science to be done before you could ever think that's a good thing to do. And, and that's what motivates us. What motivates us, and we've done some 70 more of these after Moderna. We, Moderna was our number 18 company. In fact, it was, uh, it was organized as a company called LS18. We're now at like 89 or something. But the basic essence was start with that hypothesis. What if you could do this? And then start getting rid of some of the obstacles. And that's how the journey started. And we assembled a small team within Flagship. We started doing some experiments. We filed some patents uh, and eventually spun out the entity that is now Moderna. Uh, and we were very fortunate to get some early, very capable scientists and importantly leader in Stefan Bansell, and we were off to the races. So now I wanna bring us up to the current pandemic. Um, and I'm gonna lay out a couple of questions that I've been sort of thinking about. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit of the early days of the partnership with uh, NIAID, NIH, and then also um, what made you think you could build this vaccine? And then I am, really curious, and this is a place I wanna spend a little time on talking about. You know, I've, I had a chance to talk to the founders of, uh, of BioNTech uh, a few months ago and about why they decided to go into partnership with Pfizer, for instance, because they were a small company and they couldn't possibly figure out how to make large numbers of, of doses. And there were a bunch of other reasons. You guys didn't, you sort of, um, you figured out the beyond the sort of science and the clinical trial, how do you make tens of millions, hundreds of millions of these things uh, reliably uh, with a high, high, high degree of fidelity? So I'm curious about that part of the journey as well. But if you don't mind starting us off kind of in the early days of 
the development of the Moderna vaccine uh, against SARS-CoV-2. Uh, just a little bit of like what happened there? How did that partnership work? Uh, what made you think you could pull this off? Yeah, so <clears throat> let, me, let me just say a couple of words about the 2010, 2020 journey, very few yeah. words, because from, from there, it may seem a little more understandable what we did, what we did and didn't do. So bet- when we started in 2010, we, we literally had a lot of science to do, but then we quickly decided that we needed to develop a platform. And this is a fundamentally different uh, m- mindset in the biotech world than what had preceded us. There is no biotech platform to speak of if you define a platform as a common repeatable set of technologies or, or knowledge from which you can derive multiple products, this kind of repetitive modular nature, that's not the way biotech has usually worked. Every protein is bespoke. Every small molecule has a, has a, has a complicated set of, uh, you know, our groups that the digital chemists move around. And there's very little that is reproducible about it. We really thought as, as a code molecule, mRNA could be that. And the reason I mention it is that we literally spent uh, $2.5 billion of investor money over a nine-year period building this exquisite platform, including hundreds of patents that, that, that cover much of what we were able to do with it. Uh, that platform meant we had to figure out the delivery technology, which we also spent uh, substantial resources developing a brand new way of doing this uh, based on work that had been done, but advancing quite a bit for this kind of molecule of mRNA, which had never been de- delivered before. And so I say all that because if you now take a snapshot of what we had going into 2010, before we ever heard COVID as a, as a word, uh, we had uh, some 20, almost 20 programs in clinical trials. About half of them were vaccines. We had gone into human testing for nine, I believe, or 10 human vaccines. And then the rest were therapeutics drugs in cancer and cardiovascular and rare disease. So the notion, because the world had never heard of Moderna, everybody thought Moderna did nothing before, but actually Moderna had a vast set of uh, trials, all early stage, phase one, some phase two. More importantly, also as background, we had in 2015 done the very first vaccine trial ever with mRNA, five years before the second one was done by others externally. And that was for flu. And it was for strains of flu that have not yet entered the human species. So these were threats and it was for pandemic preparedness. And we literally thought that was the safest thing to do was to use sequences that humans have never seen and see how much antibody we can generate. And sure enough, in every single subject we gave it to, we generated neutralizing antibodies at levels that with flu we know to be with correlates of protection protective. And that was a very interesting, now in hindsight, uh, uh, presaging of what was to come. But the other vaccines we worked on ranged from RSV to CMV to Zika to many others. And I say all that because it's not as though we entered 2020 with, with a kind of a dearth of knowledge on how mRNA could be used. We knew quite a bit in the vaccine area. Um, What ensued was that we learned about this uh, uh, pneumonia-like kind of uh, uh, a set of symptoms that were were reported in the first instance. And and I remember it well, in in January 21st, happens to be uh, one of my daughter's birthdays, I I was celebrating with her and I literally was called out to take a call in the middle of a pretty cold night in Cambridge. And and I spoke to Stefan Mansell, the CEO of of Moderna, who at the time had been talking in Europe to several of the, the, the public health officials and, and some of the pandemic preparedness organizations like CEPI and, and others. And it was very clear that they were beginning to start worrying. This was, this was mid-January, now January 21st. And we quickly decided, quite a fateful decision, that we should add yet another program, which was kind of crazy to do, uh, on just making enough materials to do a phase one trial quickly and we thought this was not a pandemic at the time. People, very few people had been reported as having died. But we thought this was a great way to test our platform's rapid response capability, something that you cannot do in normal times. Because as you know, in the pharma industry, it's a game of what we call hurry up and wait. You know, you kind of like rush to the starting line and then you got a marathon. So it doesn't, doesn't really get you. So that's, that was the beginning. Um, now, speaking of, of what you said about the, the, the BioNTech, founders, we can come back to that. But I must say, I'm, I'm, 
quite at a distance impressed by what they were able to do happily at that because they, to my knowledge, had previously never worked on a infectious disease vaccine because their whole company was dedicated to cancer. And, and, and the, the turnaround they did together with Pfizer to be able to do what they've been able to do is great because, because we at least had 10 years of work on mRNA as that's the be all and end all what we used to do. And, and, and I'm glad to see that they were able to get their platform uh, uh, to be able to be redirected to that. And, and we can talk about the partnership idea if you'd like now or later, but that's kind of how it started. So, so, yeah, so talk to me a little bit about the partnership idea and how, um, how that has played out. And, uh, and again, just the ability to make the kind of large volume vaccines that you guys have been able to do. How has that, how has that worked? Um, I think, by the way, just as a quick reflection, it's a, your story of the last decade is a really important example of, you know, the old idea of sort of like, um, you know, uh, serendipity kind of comes with a prepared mind. But there was this was not a random event that you had actually, in many ways, spent the last 10 years preparing for this. Uh, and then and then uh, you jumped on it. But um, how, how does this company go to making as I said, uh, hundreds of millions of doses of something reliably, et cetera. Kind of what has that journey been like? Well, it, it's, it's, as they say, it's complicated. Um, prior to the start of this journey in 2020, we had, I think, dosed maybe some 2,000 humans with one or another mRNA. And so the production scales we had were at the thousands of doses level because we had no commercial products. Um, we were fortunate to have employed a, a fantastic leader of our manufacturing tech development organization, Juan Andres, who used to have that role at all of Novartis before and had gone through for the flu pandemic and had scaled up many, many processes. Not mRNA, but nevertheless, great experience. He had built a fantastic team. We'd built a facility in Norwood, Massachusetts, where we were making mRNA uh, for you know, our own current trials. That was the baseline. Now, um, when, when, when this happened, we were also fortunate to have had a standing partnership with the NIH, the NIAID under, under uh, Dr. Fauci, uh, which, 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 where we had already worked on MERS together, a vaccine for MERS. And so we also had some idea about spike proteins and, and, and the work they had done previously for many years. And we knew that at least in the case of MERS, we could make antigens that could pretty actively get the immune system to, to generate neutralizing antibodies. And so that was in the background. And, and so we decided that we had the wherewithal to make enough doses for a phase one trial. And since that was what was only thing on the horizon, we said, let's start that right away. As you know, 44 days after we got the sequence of the virus, we entered a human arm uh, for the first time. And so that was an interesting journey, but we weren't thinking hundreds of millions of doses quite yet. Now, I will say, we haven't talked much about this, that it's not like we didn't have discussions about the possibility of partnering with folks to scale up, but we were not as dependent on those folks because we had already been making many, many mRNAs. And so we were a little bit more advanced, I'd say, than a regular biotech company. It was a public company. It had you know over a billion dollars of capital that it had at its disposal to do things. It didn't have tens of billions the way a large pharma does, but it also wasn't so dependent on, on, on the, the capital markets immediately. So all of that led us to look for partners that were truly complementary, not to rely on them completely for scale up. And, and that proved difficult for us to find. Uh, you may know that we forged a partnership many months later with Takeda, with whom we've, been, we've entered the Japanese market, but largely to help us get registration there and supply. But on the manufacturing side, we found our answer in a partnership with a set of partners, but most importantly, Lonza, which is a contract manufacturer. We needed to train them to make this type of mRNA, which is not kind of common knowledge, although our patents describe much of the capabilities as, as it is, and we'll come back to that. Uh, and so that's the route that we chose. It was a little by default and a little by failing to find the right complementary partner amidst the pharmaceutical industry when we were looking for it. Um, I am, I am I'm partly looking at questions that are coming in, and there is a, a question from uh, Kate Elder that I want to get to, uh, which is really a big question, and you will not be surprised by this question. Um, 
and let me frame it in the kind of following way, which is you have laid out the the experience of competition, the, the value of it for driving innovation, for driving improvements in, in, in kind of people's performance and, and, and ultimately leading to so many of the gains that we have. Yet there is a flip side of this, which is when you are in a global pandemic, the notion of cooperation, of sharing, of the need, the urgent need, the moral, epidemiological public health need to vaccinate the world uh, is also really, really important. And I do not have to tell you that um, there has been frustration, and I wanna talk about whether rightly or wrongly, uh, with the companies that have built these incredible life-saving vaccines. And my disclosure is I got the Moderna vaccine and, and feel incredibly blessed to have gotten it. Uh, but there are lots of people in the world who have not. And so, I would love for you to answer two related questions. One is as an entrepreneur and as a, um, as a person who looks at billions of dollars of private investment and thinks you have to recoup it and you have to have the private markets work, how do you deal with the fact that we've got to do a better job in general improving access to life-saving medicines? And then specifically for this pandemic, um, what is Moderna's obligation to help vaccinate the world, uh, including and maybe particularly countries and people who can't afford it? So kind of a broader question, which comes up in every context. And then I want to also just talk a little bit about this specific context. No, I'm, I'm very happy you're asking it. And let me try to give as comprehensive an answer as I can. Um, and it will reflect my set of beliefs and my experiences. First of all, you know, in nature, competition and cooperation coexist, um, uh, and, and they are the, the, the essence of what an ecosystem is. An ecosystem basically creates an environment within which cooperation is rewarded, and therefore competition is reduced enough for the whole to gain an advantage from an evolutionary standpoint than would be available to the parts. And much as that is the case, Definitely for the pandemic, during the pandemic, an ecosystem effect was created naturally where we cooperated and we continue to cooperate massively. None of this would have happened but for the cooperation that started back in January of 2020 uh, among the government uh, labs, NIH in particular, and the, the, the R&D groups and then the manufacturing groups, <clears throat> then BARDA's involvement to facilitate the scale up, the OWS formation, which let me say kind of categorically, but for OWS, none of this would have happened. This is not a political statement, especially since my political, political leanings are, are not supportive of that. But I can tell you that, that that was a fantastic decision that was made because it wouldn't have been possible without that coordination. Supply chains were, were influenced, et cetera. And that cooperation continues. There's been cooperation between the vaccine developers, um, et cetera, et cetera. And that cooperation should continue and should have continued as it related to getting doses to low-income countries. And, and I personally have advocated for that during the first six months of this year, not the last six days of this year, uh, because as a, a, a participant in this ecosystem, the thing that was clear to me was that the Western countries, most notably the US and Europe, had already secured the vast uh, a majority, if not all, of the supply going into 2021, and they knew that. The only source of donations and supply legally would have been through the governments. And so I have advocated that, have tried to implore governments to do that. And look, during the first six months of this year, she that would have been political suicide. And so nobody, but nobody wanted to talk about it. Uh, fortunately, although we haven't really gotten too high a level of vaccination in this country, the, 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 the environment has allowed at least for some consideration to be given to begin to fulfill what I think is the developed world's obligation, which is to ensure that the world gets sufficient vaccine supply. To do that, we have to cooperate even more. And, and, and we are. But I'll tell you also categorically that the notion is that that is being limited by what manufacturers do is rhetoric, absolute rhetoric. 
and I can I can fill you in on that. But, but I can tell you. Let, let's stay with this for a minute because sure. it is the thing that um, look, um, it is the thing that is bothering a lot of people the most. And I, I'll I'll articulate in the following way, which is. People say, well, why aren't you releasing your intellectual property um, on this? Because again, global pandemic, lots of people die. Uh, second is why aren't you, and this is not by the way, targeting Moderna only. People are saying the same thing about Pfizer, about J&J. So I, I definitely do not want to turn this into a personal conversation. It's a broader discussion that we're having in society, technology transfer, because it's not just about IP, right? Um, because there is an urgent need to scale up more manufacturing. We just need more vaccines than we have right now. And so um, I would love to hear your thoughts yeah. on IP technology transfer. Um, have they been adequate priorities? Should you have done more? Could you do more? Sure, happy to. Again, I think whenever we're talking about these topics, people have to have an open mind to hear the answers that sometimes are not convenient answers. The reason I started with supply is that legally the manufacturers were forbidden to send a single dose anywhere other than where they were bought. And so the notion that we should have done more, reality is, sorry, to I don't wanna seem defensive, but the reality is that the very entities that are now saying that are the reason we could not do more. I'm starting from that end, let me work backwards. Intellectual property. Your audience may or may not know, it's a matter of the record, that last October, before we had, and you and I talked about this in the past, before we had a vaccine that was authorized, we, Moderna, unilaterally announced we would not enforce our intellectual property during the pandemic for anyone who uses our intellectual property to fight the pandemic. We own a vast amount of intellectual property in the use of mRNA for vaccines, predates everyone by many years, and we took that step unilaterally. Remarkably, no newspaper covered it, no politician covered it. People thought, why are these people even doing this? The reason we were doing it is that we could foresee that intellectual property would be a sensitive topic. And, and clearly, just again, people have to go do the research. Our patents describe the vast amount of knowledge that already is out there, constitutionally protected, but also obligated by us to make available for other people to use. We did that without the threat of any, any license or... or uh, uh, enforcement obligation. So I think the very first step that Moderna already took was in the public interest. And we did that. No WHO, no trip, nothing had to be told to us to do it last October. First point. Second point, as it relates to your question about technology transfer, uh, it's look, long before this pandemic, this issue of technology transfer has been raised for decades, as you well know, this is not a new topic. And what I believe is that that is a very reasonable thing to consider if in fact you have a supply constraint. But the reality is, and that's the thing that people seem not to want to, to add up, that between Pfizer's supply and Moderna's scale-up supply that's already being put in place for 2022, we will have, we believe, and I believe Pfizer believes, more than adequate capacity to vaccinate the world if the political will was there to help the countries actually achieve that goal. And so in the face of that, and in the face of the fact that we believe our production, we, we have said we will produce up to 3 billion doses next year. We are putting in place the investments to do that. Um, there is no way that a new supplier, even with our help, will produce doses within that time frame of that volume. Supplemental doses, even if they were at a good enough quality, frankly would kick in in 23, 24, and as you may know, last week, we announced that we will, on our own uh, uh, volition, set up a plant in Africa to produce supplemental doses for the future on the territory so that there's a technology transfer available in the continent for mRNA. So we're doing that. That is, in our view, a, 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 an additive step. But look, I, I cannot explain it any other way. The, the news media have taken my words and, and portrayed them in a we will not give our IP. We have already given our IP. That's why there are multiple mRNA vaccines, and we will more than happily scale a supply to be able to be sufficient. I believe that if you accept those, 
And again, people are free to doubt. Obviously, people are doubting vaccine. Why would they doubt? Why wouldn't they doubt supply projections? But if people are willing to accept that, then then the reason to do it, nevertheless, ends up being a little more kind of anti-patent or let's say changing the rules of patents, not pandemic related. So using the pandemic to drive an agenda that has existed for a long time. In my view, Ashish, sorry, personally, now I'm talking very personally, I've lost my father-in-law to this pandemic. I don't want people to use this pandemic for other agendas than what is in fact in front of us. As a company, I can assure you, we are, and the 2,000 people that work at Moderna, doing everything we can to achieve the scale and, and we can talk about that too, make sure that at a not-for-profit cost, it's available to low-income countries. That's what we're working towards, and we expect we'll do that. We have a $500 million uh, announced uh, option deal with COVAX, of which some 200, 000, uh, $200 million has already been taken. We are working with the U.S. government and other places to assure a billion doses to low-income countries next year. So we think the supply will be there. We think access will be there if the governments can collaborate, and the intellectual property freedom has already been given. The rest, again, sorry for being assertive and saying this, I think is other agendas at play. Look, first of all, um, the issue of Moderna um, saying they will not enforce their intellectual property rights is true. And I, I mean, I just will say I have known this, I don't I didn't know if I knew it in October, but certainly by the beginning of this year, um, that, part, that part was clear. I also think, uh, and I wanna move on from this because there's a bunch of like questions I wanna ask about global public health and mRNA technology, but I'm gonna make one, last comment on this, uh, Nubar, which is, um, I think people are completely underestimating how much vaccine supply is going to happen over the next six months. The problems are Africa. The continent of Africa is just under vaccinated because they don't have, uh, there's not enough capability and everybody is, uh, every government has been locking up supply and keeping supply um, from getting out into the world. And, uh, and, you know, Governments blame companies, but I think there that there's a broader issue here of the failure to share that is very much a policy problem. Um, but we are we're vac- we're putting in about a billion doses of vaccines into people's arms. We've got about six and a half billion doses out there. We'll be at nine by the end of the year. I don't see anything that makes me think that manufacturing is going to fall off the cliff. And if that manufacturing continues at current pace, we'll be at fifteen billion doses by next June. Yes. Uh, and we'll have a large chunk of the world. Again, the issue is the African continent, which is the part that really bugs me that we need to be doing. And that takes world. coordination and that takes political will, not beating up on easy targets who are actually part of the solution, not the problem. Can we talk about, um, thank you for your willingness to take on that question. And I, I know I pushed you a little bit, but I am grateful for your, uh, for your answer. I want to talk about mRNA as platform for things that are not SARS-CoV-2. Um, because there are, and actually you brought up pandemic influenza, something that many of us have been worried about. I think five years ago, if you and I were talking and we talk about a pandemic in 2020, I would have said, yes, influenza, right? That's what we were all worried about. That risk is still there. Um, but there is a unfinished business around malaria. And I feel like we're starting to see some really nice progress on malaria, uh, tuberculosis, uh, diseases that continue to affect hundreds of millions, if not billions of people. Um, what are, in, in your mind, what are the prospects for, now that we have really demonstrated, we can get mRNA delivered into people's bodies, we can get people to create proteins that, are, you know, that, that generate a robust uh, humoral and cellular immunity. Um, how, how do we take this platform to start really working on a lot of other infectious diseases? I'm not even going to talk about the cancer stuff, which I know has been a major focus, but let's stay with infectious diseases, which continue to be a huge problem globally. Um, how do you think about that agenda? Well, I mean, look, um, the good news on that front is that we were working on all of those things before the pandemic. And now we know 500 million doses later of ours and another 500 million from others that we can safely deliver these to humans and at least for one pandemic be a, be a formidable opponent to the virus. That simply de-risks what's ahead. Um, and, and, but, but we didn't need this pandemic to realize just what a need the world has and to already work on it. Good news is those who are interested, 
at Moderna's site is the most recent R&D day, a link to the most recent R&D day. And you will see a vast expose of the programs that are already going on. We have some 20 different vaccines under development with mRNA technology. The time it takes for us to go from a sequence, and in some cases, many cases, many antigens in one vaccine, all the way to the testing is very short, as we've just seen. So we, so what we have said publicly is that we are actively working not only on our historic vaccine programs, but in HIV, we have a very active new program that, that is accelerating now. In seasonal influenza, we, we, we are soon going to have data uh, showing what kind of neutralizing antibodies we can make for a seasonal influenza. We believe by next fall, we should be in a position to have a combination product, which both boosts for COVID and boosts essentially for the seasonal flu. We will add to that RSV because we think that the respiratory threats are the, 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 both the most de-risked right now and the most needy from a, from a world spread standpoint. But we will not stop with that. We believe that, that a kind of a, sh a shielding strategy that shields us against multiple variants of COVID, multiple variants of, of influenza and others is possible. And I also would say that we should not resign ourselves to 50% effective vaccines going forward. People thought 50% is good because they thought you couldn't do better. Uh, at 90, 95%, I can't say that we'll do that every single time, but boy, should we try because the need justifies it. So, and, and look, the, the other thing is, you know, whenever people talk about vaccines, there's a public health uh, 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 almost expectation that you're gonna have to twist people's arms to work on it because they're gonna end up losing money. It's not a really good business. None of that turns out to be true, but because of the technology, it can be rapidly deployed, reused, and you don't start from scratch each time. I think that it's a very viable place to make significant new medicines. And look, Moderna has said, this is what we will do on behalf of the world to the maximum extent we can. The resources we have to do it will be deployed for vaccines, by the way, including vaccines for diseases that only exist in the developing world, that only exist in low-income countries. We have done that on a, on a uh, kind of a basis of philanthropy. And we, we, this is what the, this company will be doing alongside cancer and many other things that we, we will deploy. So yeah, look, we're just at the beginning. What this did is alerted the world to the potential. We were already working on this uh, potential and we hope it will become more and more the reality. And just staying on the science of this for a second, what do you think is the kind of scientifically the bigger challenge or do you think it is a bigger challenge to work on cancer therapeutics or cancer vaccines? Like, is that a meaningfully different set of scientific and intellectual challenges? Or do you see it as comparable to managing a complex uh, organism like uh, the one that causes malaria, which often also has a lot of complexity to it? Uh, just help me, help me think about how you think about the cancer stuff compared to the infectious diseases. I think that in cancer, um, we're dealing with some added complexity having to do with the immune suppressive nature of cancer itself, such that, you know, cancer is dealing with a genome that is far more complex than a viral genome or a bacterial genome, and which has in it the, the, the potential for all of human life, meaning in the genome is information that can be unlocked and misused by a cancer to survive in a way that if you don't have something in the genome of a virus, or, 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 or a parasite, there's nothing it can do about it. It cannot make a, a PD-1 suppression. It cannot do all the things that cancers end up doing. So cancer is a formidable, you know, I, I will say in a non-scientific way, going after cancer is probably like going after the totality of the, of the virus contingent on the planet all at once because of all the diversity of things all viruses could potentially do, except in any given cancer, you're up against all of that. Uh, now, some of what we've learned will be applicable because cancers also are hypermutable and some of the, the variations that it presents become a vulnerability that mRNA as an information molecule can rapidly respond to. Your audience may not know that we're already in human trials with vaccines for cancer that are personalized to that one person's vaccine and contain some 35 different antigens. Think 35 different spike protein types, all of which the immune system is seeing as foreign and is mounting an immune response against. And we're hopeful that that plus other complementary ways to suppress the, the kind of things cancer does will have effect. But that, that is a different 
battle, but but it's just a more sophisticated, you know, cancer is probably, and I don't want to use a battle analogies too much, but cancer is like a world war compared to a local fight. They're all serious, people die, but but it's going to take some time to apply all this to cancer. Yeah, and of course, um, as you allude to, different cancers are different. Some of them are much more responsive to immunologic response than, than, and than others. Uh, but it does strike me as, a, as you said, a, a deeply formidable um, challenge. One, one last question that sort of ties together several of the things you brought up. So I do think that we are entering, and in many ways this pandemic has certainly heralded and, and the, the building of the vaccines uh, as quickly as we did, not just on the mRNA technology, but what Johnson & Johnson did with um, you know, Dan Baruch's uh, lab and uh, AstraZeneca's work with Oxford. I mean, again, these are extraordinary accomplishments around the globe. It is gonna be a golden era for life sciences. I mean, there's no question in my mind that, that uh, the decades to come are gonna see incredible innovations in tackling diseases. I think many of us continue to worry about how do we make sure that all of that innovation, that there is a, eco, in, a financial ecosystem that supports that, that innovation, but at the same time, the fruits of that innovation are available to as many people around the world, including and particularly people who can't afford to pay for it. Do you have a, this is really a broader question. Do you have thoughts about what else we should be doing in the policy world, uh, kind of in the global health architecture that we have uh, to make sure that we continue to both promote innovation, but also get the, uh, get the, the fruits of that innovation to a, as broad of an audience or broad of a population as possible. Let me just give, give two quick answers to that because we're running out of time, but let me just uh, say the following. One, I think we're entering not only an era, a golden era in life science, but also in uh, working on problems before they exist. Um, preventive or what we call preemptive medicine has to be an area that we don't shun going forward for every kind of disease, not just for, for respiratory infectious diseases. And I sure hope that policymakers, private sector collaborate and the regulators collaborate in making that, that lesson come out of this. We were completely unprepared, not just for this pandemic, but for anything that is, that is different than a late stage disease. That's all medicine is dealing with by and large, and we have to move upstream. So that's one general thing that I think is gonna help reshape a healthcare and make it really healthcare and not sick care. The other, the other side to your question about making things uh, more broadly available and accessible. Look, I think that, and this may you know, not surprise you, but let me just say it very emphatically. I think that corporations, uh, certainly in my case, the corporation I know well, Moderna, I understand well that they operate with a license with society that is only available if they fulfill their responsibilities. We take that extremely seriously. We jumped into this in order to gain that license to operate and to grow, and we intend to maintain it. I would not be cynical to the notion that corporations only care about profits or that politicians always say, you know, things that are just to get reelected and all the stereotypes that exist in society that divide us. I think that Pfizer, J&J, certainly we, Moderna and others have operated with a keen sense of where their license to operate comes from. And we should just allow those companies to do that. In the meantime, I think governments should stand up and actually be held accountable for a global agenda, not a national local agenda. If we can use this pandemic experience, and we've got a long way to go to vaccinate the whole world, if we can use that to show an example of unprecedented collective action, I have not seen it yet, by the way, Ashish, I, I would rate our global ability to collaborate. This might surprise you as, as somebody who's under attack, but I would rate our ability to collaborate through institutions that exist as, as almost a failure. That means it's an opportunity for us to fix it. And if we can, the beneficiary would be what we do with climate change. Because if we can't deal with this on a global level and make sure that everybody has access to the fruits of the innovations, then I'm not sure how climate change has any chance of being worked on. So I think these are connected. We're doing our part, we'll continue to. I'm trying my own personal side of this. And, and I hope that this can serve as an example, a good example, not a bad example. 
It, it is one o'clock and I'm going to make one quick comment and then I'm going to thank you. I, you know, um, obviously there's been a lot of things that have not gone as well as we would like in this pandemic. Um, and collective action has been very, very difficult. But I have been struck by how much most political leaders I have spoken to want to try to get the answer right. Uh, I have spoken to companies involved, including uh, you throughout the pandemic, and have felt that uh, people are trying to get us to a better place. And of course, everybody has their own agenda and everybody's got their own constraints and their own set of issues that they need to manage. Uh, but I've actually been struck by how much there is collective interest in trying to move the world in the right direction. And I think Moderna has been a really important part of that. And so um, I want to say thank you for the service of, of building vaccines and getting them out quickly and uh, having a profound effect as part of a broader ecosystem. Um, thank you for your story about your personal journey, um, how you came to be where you are, and reminding us that, you know, in the, in the words of uh, Hamilton, uh, the show, you know, immigrants really do get the job done. Um, and thank you for taking time to be with us today. This was incredibly instructive, helpful. And thank you for letting me poke you a bit on some of the harder questions, but I was grateful for your willingness to do that. And uh, Nubar, you've really, you really have been an extraordinary leader in this pandemic, and I am grateful for your time and uh, for teaching us a lot about how to move forward. Ashish, I thank you for giving me the opportunity, and I hope you'll have me back next year so we can talk about the billion doses that we got to the low-income countries, not the 50 million doses that we've already got to low-income countries this year. I really look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.